finish up tonight talking about. Oh, okay. We're gonna finish up tonight talking about the the time of the patriarchs. There's a lot of stuff that I had to leave off, um, but there are many areas I can direct you in. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about, especially during the time of the Exodus, you're not gonna find it in a book because it comes from my own personal time of studies. It just extended periods of, of <laughs> alone time in my office, <laughs> um, like with the remains of the mummies and that kind of stuff. So a lot of the stuff you're not really going to find in a book per se, but there are many books I can give you to, to get going in the right direction if anybody's interested. Um, this week and last week relied heavily on the book On the Reliability of the Old Testament by Ke Ke Kenneth Kitchen that I mentioned. Um, it I used um, the Archaeology in the Old Testament by, uh, I think that one was by Horth. Um, and uh, those are the two two really good sources uh, that I recommend. But other than that, um, just a lot of a lot of reading. <laughs> um, okay, so just to recap from last week, it's 400 years from the promise given to Abraham until the law was given to Moses. Okay, so because the law was given at the same year that the Exodus happened, about three months later. So same same. 430 years. Um, these are the dates of their births and the dates of their death, which we which we just kind of established, I think it was two weeks ago. So now we'll actually get into things. So uh, one thing I wanted to look at was religion um, as, it, as it applies uh, to the time of the patriarchs, because um, I, I really feel like this is important. Uh, in Exodus, it, t it tells us that um, God is talking to Moses, and he says, by my name, Yahweh, they did not know me. But then in the book of Genesis, um, they do know him by the name of Yahweh. So it's kind of like this, a little bit of confusing. Now, we can get around that one of two ways. The first way is that the editor of Genesis went and added the name Yahweh into the text, so that way they would know we would know that we're talking about the same God. The second workaround, workaround is that we're translating the part in Exodus wrong, wrong where it's actually a rhetorical question. Did I not make my name name known as Yahweh to them? Rather, it's like a statement, a rhetorical question. Um, both of those are are, are possibilities. Um, I will just kind of let you come to your conclusions, but those are the possibilities. So, animal sacrifice. This was common. The the, the way before the law was ever given. Totally common. Um, but here's here's one of the big breakaways. Okay, shepherds didn't use temples, and they actually didn't leave documents. So we have a very um, small knowledge as to what the religion was like for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they didn't leave us any trials. And in, in Genesis, it's it's very, very briefly mentioned. Like it'll say um, they built an altar to the Lord, and that's it. Is, so it's just a pile of rocks. Did they reuse it? What did that look like? And you know, and the, the, the specifics really aren't there. Um, so yeah, there's that. And so that takes us to this, the, the name of Yahweh. Okay, so Yahweh is the only one that had uninterrupted worship of the gods that existed from this time to now. Yahweh has been worshipped in Christianity and in, um, in, in, in Judaism. And some people think in uh, Islam, I don't think that that's a thing because the god of Islam, Islam made himself known as, as Allah. But Allah is a very gen general term, which could just be translated as God. So it, it, it really just depends who you're talking to, whether Yahweh, um, whether the Islamists believe that Yahweh is the same as Allah. But um, their, their, their characters are completely different, so as far as from a Christian standpoint, it's not the same God, but that doesn't mean that they might not think that it's the same God. Um, okay. So this is kind of significant considering, um, you know, people really don't worship Ra anymore. Um, I know that some people have gone back to back to pagan gods in more recent years with the rise of cultic activities that's been going on. Um, but there was still a break of worship to those Egyptian gods, you know, from hundreds of years. Whereas Yahweh, you know, the one left standing. I, I, this is kind of significant if you think about it. He was the only one who had a significant different character than all those other gods. You know what I mean? The only one who claimed to have given us a book that is unlike any other ancient book. Um, actually, any unlike any modern book, too, for that matter. Um, and, 
you know, then his character's completely different, and then he lasted all this time when the other ones came and went. So there's kind of a, kind of a, worth thinking about. Um, there, there was a man named Wilhelm Schmidt who uh, argued that all polytheism developed from monotheism. So basically every uh, group that b worships multiple gods, if hypothetically, if the, if the historical documents had lasted, that they would have all come from monotheism. Now this would argue strongly for Yahweh being the original god. Um, it's mostly unprovable, but it, it he does offer a lot of a lot of insights. He wrote his own book that was I think the last one was in 1975 was the re-release or whatever. I don't remember exactly, but you can look that up if you're interested. Just by his name, it would probably show up. Um, but basically, how it looks is every polytheistic um, culture has this this sky god who um, the farther back you go has more of a prominent position and then slowly uh, kind of becomes less important and other ones kind of take his place, like the the, multi the multitude of gods eventually just kind of take his place in, in history and that sky god becomes less known in later years. Um, and see, this would actually make sense because from what we can tell, a lot of gods were actually once people that did really big things that... Uh, people eventually just deified and then whatnot. And then obviously with God, God doesn't act how we think he should all the time. So this could sometimes cause people to think that there might be multiple gods at war with each other because, you know, sometimes God does this and sometimes he does this. And it's like, well, so maybe there's two different gods. And, uh, you know, without anything to guide their assumptions, it's possible that they just kind of went way off. So... Uh, How do I want to say this? So whatever polytheism came from, there was kind of just a break where monotheism more or less died out. And that takes us to the question of did Abraham worship Yahweh? And if so, did he worship Yahweh before he was called by Yahweh in Genesis 12? Or did he just simply worship gods or a sky god or, or what, and God called him out from the pagan culture as salvation? Well, we really don't know. We don't know anything before the call. We just know that there's this guy Abraham that Yahweh did make his presence known to. So there's that. Um, and then we have this problem of the problem of monotheism. All monotheism comes from Judaism. Christianity spawned from Judaism. Islam spawned from Judaism. And Yahweh is the only God who has this monotheistic culture, this one God. Okay, So that, that in itself is a little bit of a problem because we have no way of explaining it. Now, we could say hypothetically, well, it was, it was destined to happen. But it didn't happen except for in one time with the people of Israel and the whole world. So there's kind of that big issue. Then you have the problem about... Monotheism, you don't really see it in history until after the time of the Exodus. So this is kind of a kind of another thing that's worth thinking about. And this is my point here. You don't find evidence for Yahweh until no earlier than the 1400s BC. He's not referenced in any um, of the Canaanite things uh, until after Israel was already established in Canaan. And why that's important is because some people have said, well, he was just a Canaanite god that um, you know, was w gained prominence by the Israelites. But we don't actually see him associated with any of the other gods until the Bible already says that Israel started worshiping other gods in combination with Yahweh. So we have this name Yahweh that appears out of thin air, and from the earliest details, it's singular, one God. Even when Egypt mentions the nomads of Yahweh, it never mentions any other um, gods in connection to him. Um, the Bible never mentions them. Nothing, there's nothing to tie Yahweh to other gods, but yet people are very quick to say, Yahweh was just a Canaanite god. So we have this, that that's really a, a problem that's worth investigating there. Um, so seeing Yahweh during the time of Israel's monarchy in combination with other gods doesn't prove that Yahweh was a Canaanite god. All that that proves is that at some time he was worshipped alongside other gods. 
That's all that that proves, which the Bible already told us that they did that. So it's really not saying that the Bible is wrong. It's just saying, yeah, we already knew that. Um, the Bible says that Israel began worshiping multiple gods fairly early, and this is something worth once again worth thinking about because if you read a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the stuff about uh, the ancient Near East, one of the big things that people always bring up is the problem of Yahweh. He was just a Canaanite god that rose to prominence. Well, okay, what's your proof for that? Well, because Israel wasn't in Canaan, or the the argument goes something like this: because Israel was never in Egypt. Therefore, they must have been in Canaan. Therefore, Yahweh must have just been a Canaanite god. Well, okay, that's assuming that Israel wasn't ever in Egypt. So, first, other reference to Yahweh outside of the Bible is from Egypt in, in between the 1400s and 1350. Remember, the Exodus is in 1479. So, we're talking about within 100 years, the Egyptians are referencing him by name. So it's kind of odd that that name appears for the first time after we dated the Exodus. Even if you go with the traditional dating of the 1440s, okay, it's still after that. So it would be completely erroneous to say, no, Yahweh, Canaanite God completely invented stuff when it happened after the Exodus. So then how they get around this is they saying, well, the Exodus didn't, didn't actually ever happen. Or the Exodus happened in the 1200s. You can't do that with history. You can't just pick and choose and say, I'm not going to believe anything about this because why? So there, there's definitely some things there that, that need to be analyzed better by modern scholarship. So Shasu of the lands of Yahweh is what the Egyptian reference says. Shasu is, is a term generally accepted as um, nomads, uh, sojourner, maybe um, Asiatic. Eh, so, you know, these, let's just say nomads. Nomads of the lands of Yahweh. Well, we're kind of unclear where this is. Where is, where are the lands of Yahweh? Now some people have said, "Oh, that that was that was Edom." Based on <laughs> what? <laughs> so once again, we have people trying to tie Yahweh down to something where the evidence doesn't lead to. So all of this comes comes down to is that Yahweh is mentioned for the first time outside of the Bible shortly after the time of Moses. In an area that is unspecified. Now, why is that important? Well, because we know it took time for Israel to move into Canaan. So if they didn't really have a strong foothold in the land yet, it wouldn't have been they wouldn't have been given a specific name. Oh, Israel lives in this place because they they didn't have a specific place yet. They didn't conquer the area yet. So it would have just been the nomads of the lands of Yahweh, wherever that is, that general area. So with all, all that all that considered, what it comes down to is there's a lot of people who claim that Yahweh is something else. There's no nothing to support those claims. As as, as much as they're said over and over again, very fiercely by professors, it's just not true. It's just not true. And uh, so okay. And once we look at the evidence for the uh, for the Exodus, it's gonna it's gonna be something that has to be addressed before we can dismiss Yahweh too. It's all kind of connected together. So um, there's no reference to Baal in uh, in the beginning of Genesis and whatnot. Um, actually, in through uh, I believe even up through Deuteronomy, there's no re reference of Baal. Now this helps us to know that it's prior to 1500. Um. The writing of this. Remember how I said all these different evidences are, are pointing to our dating of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob being correct. Um, so, once again, if there's no reference of Baal, that strongly suggests that it was it's before the 1500s BC, which would put Abraham right where we dated him. Um, some uh, practices of the of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, were later condemned by the law. That strongly suggests that. The law came after, rather than it being an invented account. See, because some people say, well, the stories were invented in 600 BC or so. Well, if that was a thing, then why would the patriarchs have done things that was denied by the law? Oh no, don't marry a girl and her sister. Well, <laughs> Jacob kind of messed up on that one. 
<laughs> See what I mean? So you, you have all these things that really can't be reconciled. Um, <clears throat> Israel attested in Canaan in 1200s by Pharaoh Meremtha. So that means that th there's a stele, is what it's called. It's a it's a it's a stone thing, uh, and it's it says it it says that Israel was in Canaan, and it dates to the 1200s. So let's let's think about this logically. Israel was in Canaan somewhere before 1200, right? Because for them to be mentioned by Egypt as being in, you see where I'm going with this, right? Okay, so that 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 strongly says okay, they 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 were probably in Israel in Canaan before 1200. Well, okay, so then the other document that I said it was in the 1400s, and it says Shashu of the uh, of the lands of Yahweh. So if those are the same people group separated by 200 years, which by the way there's no reference of Israel being in Canaan by anyone before 1200, so that strongly suggests, once again, if we're taking both these Egyptian documents together and it's the same people group, the only people who have ever been tied to Yahweh, then that would tell us that, that the events of Joshua and Judges happened sometime before 1200 and sometime after 1400, which would match our dating exactly. Which, once again, these things are just kind of ignored by people because they don't want, I guess, Israel to be there. Um, so Abraham could move around with Egypt, without Egyptian interference. This is kind of an important deal because... Egypt was not in control of that area at the time that Abraham was there, according to our dating. But if the stories were invented much later, or we date a Abraham much later, then we have the problem of, of Egyptian presence. Now, you might be thinking, wait, 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 hold on. If Egypt is going to come into Canaan and, and, and cause a problem, wouldn't that have been reflected because Israel would have been there? So wouldn't that have been shown in Joshua or Judges or something where they had a conflict with Egypt and Canaan? We'll get to that when we get to that. <laughs> okay, so um, there are there are mention of earlier um, early enemies who weren't there later. Um, this is actually kind of an important point. Um, see, there was this kind of uh, shifting that happened in the 1200s. Uh, the Egyptians went to war against some sea peoples. You, we know them as Philistines. Um, and they uh, moved into uh, Canaan, and there was just a lot of upheavals that went on. The actual Canaanites ended up moving north into Lebanon, and there was just a lot of a lot of shifting that that pretty much resulted with the Israelites, the Philistines, the Syrians. Like you just have this big shifting that's happening. So uh, a lot of the people that are mentioned in Genesis weren't there later. So this strongly suggests that it was written before. Um, so it's it, we have to obviously mention the Philistines. Um, if you read the book of Judges, Israel doesn't have a problem until the second half of Judges, the last half of the book of Judges. This is significant because the Philistines weren't in Canaan until after until about twelve in the twelve hundreds. Okay, so that would have meant that once again that the Merimtastila places Israel in Canaan in the 1200s, so it would have had been, to have been before that, and Judges doesn't place the Philistines there until halfway through the book of Judges, meaning that they had already been there for at least a couple hundred years, right? We're, we're putting pieces together here, which would mean uh, that, um, once again, that well, what I just said, that um, they were there a couple hundred years before that. So, okay, that, that still leaves us with a problem because Genesis says that there were some Philistines. Okay, so... There, there's a few issues. First off, Philistine could be a blanket term. Sea people. We really don't know because the Philistines didn't actually leave much of anything for us to know who they were. In fact, the only knowledge we have of the Philistines is by written by their enemies. That's not a biased account. <laughs> so we, we have kind of a problem there. Um, it's possible that there were a small group of them that came in before the main group of Philistines in the 1200s. It's also possible that, once again, it's a blanket term, that the Philistine isn't really a specific ethno group so much as um, a just a group of sea peoples that came from different areas. That's also possible. Another possibility is that um, the term was updated to the people who were there at that time just so that they could um, connect the Philistines in with their modern history, with their modern struggles. That's possible. I kind of doubt it, but it's possible. Um, okay. <coughs> so there's that.
Now, we do know that a later editor did uh, make updates and minor revisions. We know that that is a thing. Now, we know that from a few different places. We're going to look at it when we look at the Exodus for one. Um, but like, for instance, where it says Ur of the Chaldees, when the Chaldeans weren't going to be there for hundreds of years after Abraham. So we, we do know that, that there were, was an editor that, that worked on it. So there, that does kind of need to be um, noticed. Any questions so far? I know this is kind of a lot of information. So we're all good? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, sometimes there's a little bit of a uh, confusion that happens with some of the counts. It'll say something like this. So-and-so made an oath there, and because they made the oath there, it was called this. That m might not be the best way to understand that. Um, in Genesis, it says it in, in actually a few different places in the Bible. It's better to understand it like this. When the two men swore an oath there, it was called this, rather than because they swore an oath there, it was called this. Um, the places were called that before they ever got there. And as Genesis goes to such great lengths to show, excuse me, Abraham didn't conquer any of the land. He didn't force his hand on any of the Canaanites. So there's that. Um, as far as Jacob, uh, once again, I'm just going broad, I'm going real quickly by these last things. Um, the, 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 the types of flocks that, that are mentioned in the book of Genesis, they fit for that time frame. Um, the selective breeding, that was totally, that was totally a thing at this time. Um, when Jacob is going, uh, to meet Esau, his brother, after, you know, being separated for so long and he's kind of scared and he separates his, his groups out, his, his possessions out into groups. Um, that is actually, uh, what the merchants of Syria did. And since he was in Haran, which would have been that area, it's this totally fits. This is accepted practice at the time. This is all fitting. Um, uh, Jacob claimed to treat Laban better than, than customs required. This is obviously if he's true. Uh, for, first off, he bore the loss of predators, which actually was not a requirement at the time. Um, he was what the, what the requirement of the time was was that you would bring the the um, the corpses to the she to the the guy that you were shepherding his flocks for and he would cover the losses but Jacob claims that instead of doing that he just covered them himself and he took took the, took the loss so that means he went above and beyond another thing is um, uh, there was a set wage for what you were to pay people to, to do your crops I mean, I'm sorry your your, your 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 flocks not crops flocks and um, Jacob claims that Laban changed changed price, uh, changed his wages multiple times so that was very um, unethical. So that's kind of a big deal there. Um, also, when Jacob is d negotiating with Laban, he says, "I'll do, I'll do this labor, but I'll do it for this much of the sheep." He actually asked for a, um, a, an amount of, of flock less than the custom uh, dictated. So, in other words, he was requiring very little flock. Typically, I believe the the ratio was 80-20. The whoever you were watching their flocks for them. Um, they would keep 80 of the new, and then you would get 20 of the new. So f Jacob was 20%. Uh, so Jacob was asking for less than that. He was covering the losses himself, and he was being cheated by Laban, and he was still, you know, doing it. So when he goes to leave, this is like after he's gone above and beyond. This is kind of a, a big thing. He wasn't cheating Laban. Um, in fact, the only thing that he really did wrong uh, to Laban was uh, trying to get the flocks to have speckled but what he did shouldn't have worked he was doing stuff in their feeding trough and everything so that way when they mated they would you know get speckled it, that doesn't work and yet it worked i i don't <laughs> i guess god intervened or something because that medically that doesn't work you <laughs> know like <laughs> I, I don't know whatever that uh but then the other thing that that he could be said to have cheated laban uh was when his wife stole the family gods of Laban without him knowing. So uh, really, the, the, the times that, that Jacob actually did cheat Laban, it was either God doing it or his wife doing it. He was more or less ignorant in the whole process. So, okay, so that takes us to the issue of camels. I brought this up earlier. A lot of people say this couldn't have been a thing because camels are mentioned in the story and camels weren't domesticated at that time. It says that Abraham had camels and it says that Jacob had camels. I believe it said it, it says Isaac does too. Now, camels were not popular 
And if you look at the list, they're actually not mentioned first and foremost. They're not like the, the pride of, of, of this guy, uh, of any of them, but they are still mentioned. Now, with that being said, we have found the remains of camels, the uh, figurines with, uh, of camels, and pottery with, ca with camels, showing that they were domesticated all between 2000 and 1000 BC. So, yes, we can say with absolute certainty camels were domesticated at that time. So any any if somebody ever tries to tell you that, that the Genesis accounts don't happen, di didn't happen because of the camels, fooey, just complete fooey, completely not true. And the only person who would make such an outrageous claim is somebody who knows nothing about archaeology, because we have found plenty of remains to substantiate camels being domesticated at that time. Um, so there's a few more things. The slave prices that are mentioned, how how much he sold uh, um, Joseph for, for instance. Um, these all fit. In fact, if you read that book that I was telling you about by, by Kenneth Kitchen, he actually does a breakdown of slave costs throughout and how they fluctuated throughout the years, which shows us um, uh, helps us to date the different stories too. And Joseph being sold fits right into that time, right into that time frame. Um, another thing, thing the names fit during different times. Different names were more or less popular. The names that are mentioned fit into the time frame here. Now, um, another thing, uh, Semitic people did travel into Egypt. We have much documentation on that, um, not just in the 1900s, what I told you guys from last week, but also um, down at the time of the Hyksos, so in like the 1500s. Uh, you know, the, again, we see we see that um, the Asiatic people coming in. You know, the Semitic people, the people like the Israelites coming into Egypt. That's totally well documented. Um, the positions and careers mentioned uh, in, in Genesis do fit. It's a little bit unclear exactly what Joseph's title was, but um, the, the different the different uh, the different job jobs and whatnot did fit then, which is kind of an important deal because um, at different times in Egypt there were different jobs that that, that went away or, or came into being and whatnot. So this was another thing that helps us date it. Now that takes us to a second issue. Uh, people say, well, the, the accounts are not reliable because um, chariots are mentioned with Joseph. Okay, now here's where we get into the thing that I am so proud of because I, I this is this is one big thing that I found out myself, guys, okay? I, I did a lot of the studying on this, but this was one that I personally went back and, and looked at stuff. I'm very proud of this. Okay, uh, under my dating, Joseph was born in 1733 and he died in 1633 or 1623, okay? Now, now check this out. Go back over here. We have proof of chariots being used in Egypt during the 13th dynasty of Egypt, which was between 1800 and 1600 BC. Right when I said Joseph was there. So what that means... What's chariot? A chariot, that's uh, a thing that you get on and a horse pulls it. Huh. Uh, uh, so during the time of Joseph, yes, there were chariots. They had just been started to be used because of the because of the rise of the Hyksos. Now the Hyksos were people that came from Canaan and and, and Turkey and, and that area, and they moved into Egypt and they eventually just kind of seized power. And the Egyptian rulers were farther in the south, and the Hyksos rulers were up in the north. That's the short version of it. Um, they really don't come into play too much um, until we get into the Exodus. So just forget about that until we get into talking about the Exodus. Um, so yes, uh, chariots were there. Um, now, diviners that are mentioned in uh, in the book, uh, if you remember, the Pharaoh is looking for somebody to interpret his dream, and Joseph ends up interpreting the dream. Those diviners, um, they date back to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt between 1900 and 1600, once again confirming the dates of Joseph. Um, there, there's much more more to, to go here. Um, but the main the main point of this is that we're not just talking about fantasies. We're not talking about something that is completely unsubstantiated. We just looked at the last two uh, two weeks, just showing how everything perfectly fits in this time frame. Now that there, there's a few things I want you to get. First off, that tells me that my dating is probably correct. When all the pieces fit, that's usually the sign that that you're dating it correctly. The next thing that that tells us is that all the details of the Bible fit into the time that they were supposed to be written, which tells us that since this, they wouldn't have access to the, inf the information afterwards, it is probably historically preserved, which argues that they really did happen. 
it would be very difficult to, to, to take a historical fiction throughout the years getting all the historical details correct for people that didn't even exist and then dating it when they didn't have like a uh, one of those um, you know like a, a global um, dating year dating you know what I mean they, they didn't have like a global thing like we have like it's 2020 right now they didn't have that kind of thing and yet it all adds up like what are the odds of that um, so yes, it, there is no actual proof for the individual person of Abraham existing except for the existence of Israel or Isaac or Jacob. Th that is absolutely true. However, all the details fit perfectly. All the details fit perfectly. And, and that that is, is definitely something. So do we have any questions about this? Okay, next week we will, we will not be going into the Exodus. Next week, we're going to have a discussion about some of the things involving the law. Um, I'm really excited about it, but really excited about it. <laughs> um, but if there's no questions, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Good?